Today we're going to read the fourth chapter of City of Ember. When last we read chapters two and three, we learned a lot more about our main characters. We learned about Lena and her first day on the job as a messenger, and we learned about Dune and his first day on the job in the pipes work, pipe works. We also learned a lot more about the problems that are facing Ember. Today, as we read chapter four, continue to think about what we're learning about those two main characters and also what we're learning about the problem that exists in Ember and what exactly is Ember. We have to really make sure we understand the setting. So some big questions to consider as we read today. Chapter four is called Something Lost, Nothing Found. Here we go. One day, when Lena had been a messenger for several weeks, she came home to find that Granny had thrown all the cushions from the couch onto the floor, ripped up a corner of the couch's lining, and was pulling out wads of stuffing. What are you doing? Lena cried. Granny looked up. Wisps of sofa stuffing stuck to the front of her dress and clung to her hair. Something is lost, she said. I think it might be in here. What's lost, Granny? I don't quite recall said the old woman, something important. But Granny, you're ruining the couch. What will we sit on? Granny tore a bit more of the covering off the couch and yanked out another puff of stuffing. It doesn't matter, she said. I'll put it back together again later. Let's put it back now, Lena said. I don't think what's lost is in there. You don't know, said Granny darkly. But she sat back on her heels, looking tired. Lena began cleaning up the mess. Where's the baby? she asked. Granny gazed at Lena blankly. The baby? You haven't forgotten the baby? Oh, yes. She's, I think she's down in the shop. <gasps> By herself? Lena stood up and ran down the stairs. She found Poppy sitting on the floor of the shop, enmeshed in a tangle of yellow yarn. As soon as she saw Lena, Poppy began to howl. Lena picked her up and unwound the yarn, talking soothingly, though she was so upset that her fingers trembled. For Granny to forget the baby was dangerous. Poppy could fall downstairs and hurt herself. She could wander out into the street and get lost. Granny had been forgetful lately, but this was the first time she'd completely forgotten about Poppy. When they got upstairs, Granny was kneeling on the floor, gathering up the white tufts of stuffing and jamming them back into the hole she'd made in the couch. It wasn't in there, she said sadly. What wasn't? It was lost a long time ago, said Granny. My father told me about it. Lena sighed impatiently more and more. Her grandmother's mind seemed caught in the past. She could explain the rules of Pebble Jacks, which she last played when she was eight, or tell you what had happened at the singing when she was twelve, or who she danced with at the Cloving Square dance when she was sixteen, but she would forget what had happened the day before yesterday. They heard him talking about it when he died, she said to Lena. They heard who talking? My grandfather, the seventh mayor. And what did they hear him say? Ah, said her grandmother with a faraway look. That's the mystery. He said he couldn't get at it. Now it is lost, he said. But what was it? He didn't say. Lena gave up. It didn't matter anyway. Probably the lost thing was the old man's left sock or his hairbrush. But for some reason, the story had taken root in Granny's mind. So there are some clues right here that good readers catch the small details and it helps them make an inference. Let me help you with a few of the details. The first thing is, a, a couple of paragraphs ago, Granny said it was the seventh mayor, her grandfather. Way back in the beginning, when we began to read, when we read the very first section, the prologue, the instructions, they said, so the first mayor of Ember was given the box, told to guard it carefully and solemnly, sworn to secrecy. When she grew old and her time as mayor was up, 
she explained about the box to her successor, who also kept the secret carefully, as did the next mayor. Things were as planned for many years, but the seventh mayor of Ember was less honorable than the ones who'd come before him and more desperate. That's the seventh mayor. That's Granny's grandfather. Back in the instructions, it said that, and it continued on to say, He was ill. He had the coughing sickness that was common in the city then, and he thought the box might hold a secret that would save his life. He took it from its hiding place in the basement of the gathering hall and brought it home with him, where he attacked it with a hammer. But his strength was failing by then. All he managed to do was dent the lid a little, and before he could return the box to its official hiding place or tell his successor about it, he died. The box ended up at the back of a closet, shoved behind some old bags and bundles. There it sat unnoticed, year after year, until its time arrived, and the lock quietly clicked open. So, good readers that you are, you're taking that information from the instructions and putting it together with the information we just read in Chapter 4, and I bet you're making an inference. Let's keep reading and see if your inference is what really happens. Chapter four. The next morning on her way to work, Lena stopped in at the house of their neighbor, Eveline Murdo. Mrs. Murdo was brisk in her manner and in her person thin and straight as a nail, but she was kind in her unsmiling way. Until a few years ago, she'd run a shop that sold paper and pencils. But when paper and pencils became scarce, her shop closed. Now she spent her days sitting by her upstairs window, watching people in the street with her sharp eyes. Lena told Mrs. Murdo about her grandmother's forgetfulness. Will you look in on her sometimes and make sure things are all right? she asked. I will, certainly, said Mrs. Murdo, nodding twice, firmly. Lena went away, feeling better. That day Lena was given a message by Arben Swin, who ran the Calais Street Vegetable Market, to be delivered to Lena's friend Clary, the greenhouse manager. Lena was glad to carry this message, though her gladness was mixed a little with sadness. Her father had worked in the greenhouses. It still felt strange not to see him there. The five greenhouses produced all of Ember's fresh food. They were out past Greengate Square, at the farthest edge of the city. Nothing else was out there but the trash heaps, great, moldering, stinking hills that stood on rocky ground and were lit by a few floodlights high up on poles. It used to be that no one went to the trash heaps but the trash collectors, who dumped the trash and left it. Now and then a couple of children might go there to play, scrambling up the side of the heaps and tumbling down. Lena and Lizzie used to go when they were younger. They'd pull out the occasional treasure, some empty cans, maybe an old hat or a cracked plate. But not anymore. Now there were guards posted at the trash heaps to make sure no one poked around. Just recently, an official job called Trash Sifter had been created. Every day, a team of people methodically sorted through the trash heaps in search of anything that might be at all useful. They'd come back with broken chair legs that could be used for repairing window frames, bent nails that could become hooks for clothes, even filthy rags stiff with dirt that could be washed out and used to patch holes in window blinds or mattress covers. Lena hadn't thought about it before, but now she wondered about the trash sifters. Were they there because Ember really was running out of everything? Boy, I think that paragraph's got some pretty good evidence about the shortages of Ember. Beyond the trash heaps, there was nothing at all. That is, only the vast unknown regions where the darkness was absolute. From the end of Diggory Street, Lena could see the long, low greenhouses. They looked like big tin cans that had been cut in half and laid on their sides. Her breath came a little faster. The greenhouses were a home to her, in a way. She knew that she was most likely to find Clary somewhere around Greenhouse 1, where the office was, so that was where she headed first. A small tool shed stood beside the door to Greenhouse 1. Lena peeked into it but saw only rakes and shovels. So she opened the greenhouse door. 
warm, furry-smelling air washed over her, and all her love for this place came rushing back. Out of habit, she gazed up toward the ceiling, as if she might see her father there, on his ladder, tinkering with the sprinkler system, the temperature gauges, and the lights. The greenhouse light was whiter than the yellowish light of the amber street lamps. It came from long tubes that ran the length of the ceiling. In this light, the leaves of the plants shone so green they almost hurt Lena's eyes. On the days when she'd come here with her father, Lena had spent hours wandering along the gravel paths that ran between the vegetable beds, sniffing the leaves, poking her fingers into the dirt, and learning to tell the plants apart by their look and smell. There were the beans and peas with their curly tendrils, the dark green spinach, the ruffled lettuce, and the hard, pale green cabbages, some of them as big as a newborn baby's head. What she loved best was to rub the leaves of the tomato plant between her fingers and breathe in their pungent, powdery smell. A long, straight path led from one end of the building to the other. About halfway down the path, Clary was crouching by a bed of carrots. Lena ran toward her and Clary smiled, brushed the dirt from her hands, and stood up. Clary was tall and solid with big hands and knobby knuckles. She had a square jaw and square shoulders and brown hair cut short in a square, cut in a short, squarish way. You might have thought from looking at her that she was a gruff, unfriendly person, but her nature was just the opposite. She was more comfortable with plants than with people. Lena's father had always said she was strong but shy, a person of much knowledge but few words. Lena had always liked her. Even when she was little, Clary did not treat her like a baby, but gave her jobs to do, pulling up carrots, picking bugs off cabbages. Since her parents had died, Lena had come many times to talk to Clary or just to work silently beside her. Clary was always kind to her, and working with the plants took Lena's mind off her grief. Well, said Clary. She smiled at Lena, wiped her hands on her already grimy pants, and smiled some more. Finally, she said, you're a messenger. Yes, said Lena, and I have a message for you. It's from Arben Swin. Please add four extra crates to my order, two of potatoes and two of cabbages. Clary frowned. Whew. I can't do that, she said. At least I can send him the cabbages, but only one small crate of potatoes. Why? asked Lena. Well, we have a sort of problem with the potatoes. What is it? asked Lena. Clary had a habit of answering questions in the briefest possible way. You had to keep asking and asking before she would believe you really wanted to know and weren't just being polite. Then she would explain, and you could see how much she knew and how much she loved her work. I'll show you, she said. She led the way to a bed where the green leaves were spotted with black. A new disease! I haven't seen it before. When you dig up the potatoes, they're runny inside instead of hard, and they stink. I'm going to have to throw out all the ones in this bed. There are only a few beds left that aren't infected. Most people in Ember had potatoes at every meal, mashed, boiled, stewed, roasted. They'd had fried potatoes, too, in the days before the cooking oil ran out. I'd hate it if we couldn't have potatoes anymore, Lena said. I would too, said Clary. They sat on the edge of the potato bed and talked for a while about Lena's grandmother and the baby, about the trouble Clary was having with the beehives, and about the greenhouse sprinkler system. It hasn't worked right since, Clary hesitated and glanced sideways at Lena. For a long time, she said. She didn't want to say since your father died. Lena understood that. She stood up. I should go, she said. I have to take Arben Swin, the answer to his message. I hope you'll come again, said Clary. You can come whenever. You can come anytime. Lena said thank you and turned to go. But just outside the greenhouse door, she heard running footsteps and a strange, high, sobbing sound. Or rather, she heard sobs and then a wail, sobs and then a shout, and then more sobs, getting louder. 
She looked back toward the rear of the greenhouses, toward the trash heap. Clary, she called. There, there's something. Clary came out and listened. Do you hear it? Yes, said Clary. She frowned. I'm afraid it's, it's someone who... She peered toward the crying noise. Yes, here he comes. Her strong hand gripped Lena's shoulder for a moment. You'd better go. She said, I'll take care of this. But what is it? Never mind, just go on. But Lena wanted to see. Once Clary had walked away, she ducked behind the tool shed. From there, she watched. The noise came closer. Out beyond the trash heaps, a figure emerged. It was a man running and stumbling, his arms flopping. He looked as if he was about to fall over, as if he could hardly pick up his feet. In fact, as he came closer, he did fall. He tripped over a hose and crumbled to the ground as if his bones had dissolved. Clary stooped down and said something to him in a voice too low for Lena to hear. The man was panting. When he turned over and sat up, Lena saw that his face was scratched and his eyes were open in fright. His sobs had turned into hiccups. She recognized him. It was Sage Merrill, one of the clerks in the supply depot. He was a quiet, long-faced man who always looked worried. Clary helped him to his feet. The two of them came slowly toward the greenhouse, and as they got closer, Lena could hear what the man was saying. He spoke in a fast, weak, trembly voice, hardly stopping for breath. Wish her I could do it. I said to myself, just one step after another. That's all, just one step after another. I knew it would be dark. Who doesn't know that? But he thought, well, dark can't hurt you. I'll just keep going. I thought... He stumbled and sagged against Clary. Careful, Clary said. They reached the door of the greenhouse and Clary struggled to open it. Without thinking, Lena darted out from behind the tool shed and opened it for her. Clary shot her a quick look, but said nothing. Sag didn't stop talking. Oh, but then the farther I went, the darker it was. And you can't just keep walking into black dark, can you? It's, it's like a wall in front of you. I kept turning around to look at the lights of the city because that's all there was to see. And then I'd say to myself, don't look back, keep moving. But I kept tripping and falling. The ground is rough out there. I scraped my hands. He held up one hand and stared at the red scratches on it, which oozed drops of blood. They got him into Clary's office and sat him down in her chair. He rambled on, I be brave, I said to myself. I kept going and going, but then all of a sudden I thought anything could be out here. There could be a pit a thousand feet deep right in front of me. There could be <gasps> something that bites. I've heard stories, rats as big as garbage bins, and I had to get out of there. So I turned around and I ran. Never mind, said Clary, you're all right now. Lena, get him some water. Lena found a cup and filled it from the sink in the corner. Sag took it with a shaking hand and drank it down. What were you looking for? Lena asked. She knew what she would have been looking for if she'd gone out there. She'd thought about it countless times. Sag stared at her. He seemed to have to puzzle over her question. Finally, he said, I was looking for something that could help us. What would it be? I don't know, like a, a stairway that leads somewhere maybe, or a building full of... I don't know, useful things. But you didn't find anything? Or see anything? Lena asked, disappointed. Nothing, nothing. There is nothing out there. His voice became a shout and his eyes looked wild. Again. If there is, we can never get to it. Never, not without a light. He took a long, shaky breath. For a while, he stared at the floor. Then he stood up. I think I'm all right now. I'll be going. With uncertain steps, he went down the path and out the door. Well, said Claire, I'm sorry that happened while you were here. I was afraid you might be scared. That's why I told you to go. But Lena was full of questions, not fear. She had heard tales of people who tried to go out into the unknown regions. She had thought about it herself. In fact, she'd wondered the same thing as Sage. She had imagined making her way out into the dark and coming to a wall in which she would find the door to a tunnel and at the end of the tunnel would be the other city, the city of light that she had dreamed about. All it would take was the courage to walk away from Ember and end to the darkness and then to keep going. 
It might have been possible, if you could carry a light to show the way. But in Ember, there was no such thing as a light you could carry with you. Outside, lights were fixed to their poles or to the roofs of houses. Inside lights were set into the ceiling or had cords that had to be plugged in. Over the course of Ember's history, various clever people had tried to invent a movable light, but all of them had failed. One man had managed to ignite the end of a stick of wood by holding it against the electric burner on his stove. He'd run across the city with a flaming stick, planning to use it to light his journey. But by the time he got to the trash heaps, his torch had gone out. Other people latched on to his idea. One woman who lived on Deadlock Street, very near the edge of the city, managed to get into the unknown regions with her flaming stick. But the stick burned quickly, and before she could go far, the flame singed her hands and she threw it down. Everyone who had tried to penetrate the unknown regions had come back within a few hours, their enterprise a failure. Lena and Clary stood by the open door of the greenhouse and watched Saj shuffle toward the city. As he neared the trash heaps, two guards who had been sitting on the ground got to their feet. They walked over to Saj, and each of them took hold of one of his arms. Uh-oh, said Clary. Those guards are always looking for trouble. But Saj hasn't broken any law, said Lena. Doesn't matter. They need something to do. They'll get some fun out of scaring him. One of the guards was shaking his finger at Saj and saying something in a voice almost loud enough for Lena to hear. Oh, poor man, said Clary with a sigh. He's the fourth one this year. The guards were marching Saj away now, one on either side of him. Saj looked limp and small between them. What do you think is out in the unknown regions, Clary? Clary stared down at the ground where the light from the greenhouse was casting long, thin shadows on them both. I don't know. Nothing, I guess. And do you think Ember is the only light in a dark world? <sighs> Clary sighed. I don't know, she said. She gave Lena a long look. Her eyes, Lena thought, looked a little sad. They were a deep brown, almost the color of the earth in the garden bed. Clary put a hand in her pocket and drew something out. Look, she said. In the palm of her hand was a white bean. Something in this seed knows how to make a bean plant. How does it know that? I don't know, said Lena, staring at the hard, flat bean. It knows because it has life in it, said Clary. But where does life come from? What is life? Lena could see that words were welling up in Clary now. Her eyes were bright. Her cheeks were rosy. Take a lamp, for instance. When you plug it in, it comes alive in a way. It, it, it lights up. That's because it's connected to a wire that's connected to the generator, which is making electricity. Don't ask me how. But a bean seed isn't connected to anything. Neither are people. We don't have plugs and wires that connect us to generators. What makes living things go is inside them somehow. Her dark eyebrows drew together over her eyes. What I mean is, she said finally, something is going on that we don't understand. They say the builders made the city, but who made the builders? Who made us? I think the answer might be somewhere outside of Ember. In the unknown regions? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. She brushed her hands together in a time to get back to work way. Clary, Lena said quickly, here's what I think. Her heart sped up. She hadn't told this to anyone in before. In my mind, I see another city. Lena watched to see if Clary was going to laugh at her or smile in that overly kind way. She didn't. So Lena went on. It isn't like Ember. It's white and gleaming. The buildings are tall and sort of sparkle. Everything is bright, not just inside the buildings, but all around them too, even up in the sky. I know it's just my imagination, but it feels real. I think it is real. Clary said, hmm. And then she said, where would such a city be? 
that's what I don't know. Or, or how to get to it. I, I keep thinking there's a door somewhere, maybe out in the unknown regions, a door that leads out of Ember and then behind the door, a road. Clary just shrugged her shoulders. I, I don't know, she said. I have to get back to work. But here, take this. She handed Lena the bean seed, took a little pot from a shelf, scooped some dirt into it and handed the pot to Lena too. Stick the bean in here and water it every day, she said. It looks like nothing, like a little white stone, but inside it, there's life. That must be a sort of clue, don't you think? If we could just figure it out. Lena took the seed and the pot. Thank you, she said. She wanted to give Clary a hug, but she didn't, just in case it would embarrass her. Instead, she just said goodbye and raced back toward the city. So we learned a lot about Lena in that chapter. And we learned a lot about Ember, more about the unknown regions. And we learned a lot about the problem. More to come in chapter five.